Justice Chair for the Connecticut NAACP. And before I get started, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my state conference president, who had to leave earlier, and a number of the presidents of the NAACP, presidents and past presidents across the state. So I wanted to acknowledge your presence here this afternoon and then thank you for your service. Um, again, I've been the criminal justice chair for the last 10 years. And I can honestly say that we, as an NAACP, have never been more busy. For whatever reason, the number of complaints we receive, the number of issues that we deal with are much more um, telling, they're much more serious, and they're much more in number. Over the past years, the NAACP has partnered with the CHRO, DOJ, the Department of Justice, the Afro-American Affairs Commission, the Latin, Amer Latin and Puerto Rican Affairs Commission, the ACLU, and we worked in partnership on civil rights issues um, in years past when we would try to deal with these issues on our own, but we have actually formed an alliance where whenever we go at an issue, we go as a partner, and that's been very, very fruitful. We've worked with POST, which is the Police Officers um, Standards and Training, and we work with the Connecticut Commissioner of Public Safety. And the types of issues that we work with them on are, are taser use and taser abuses, um, racial profiling, um, police misconduct. We have worked with these same agencies to develop the statewide model policies that are currently in place. So, you know, for, for the NAACP, we have been at the table in all of these key issues with respect to racial profiling. I'm a member of the Racial Profiling Prohibition Project. We work for years very diligently. And in addition to CHR and another a number of people here in this office, but you know the hard work, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that report. The report was released, I believe, in the fall of 2014. That was very, very telling. What it explained is Connecticut law enforcement officers, particularly in certain communities, engage in racial profiling. We've also had to deal with the police uh, pushback to that. A lot of them are questioning the validity of the reports. The beauty of this report is it was done by a number, I, I call them whiz kids, but they're very um, well um, informed young people who understand the data, have done the data mining, and have put together a very valid document that speaks to the types of profiling that occur in the state of Connecticut. The document also can be interpreted from a state level, from a municipality, and you can drill down and even look at responsible officers. So again, the NAACP was there from the beginning and has worked with the Racial Profiling Prohibition Project, the state police, and police chief unions to deal with the issues of racial profiling. We've also met with individual police departments to talk about their specific reports and where they stand in those reports and what are they doing to change the narrative. So again, we've been very involved with that taser use. This is something that the NAACP was talking about long before it became a statewide issue. Uh, initially, our state conference president was calling to attention to the fact that the number of people dying in taser-related deaths are people of color. We need to look at how the taser is being used, who it is being applied to, and we need to establish a pattern and practice as to when you should use the tasers. There, again, is a model policy that we were at the table working to create something that can be used statewide to address this issue. Um, we also have been working in issues with criminal justice. Criminal justice. Uh, one of the things that Representative McCory talked about that the NAACP has long um, expressed concerns is again in the disparities in sentencing. I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to visit a courtroom, but if you do, you will see that it's almost like a marketplace. You have bail bondsmen who have set up, and even if you're not only in the courtroom, drive around the courtroom, you see all of these businesses that have popped up around criminal justice issues. So we need to be cognizant of that. We need to understand what is happening and who is profiting off the suffering of the people in these communities, and we need to call for an end to that. Um, again, you know, when we talk about mass incarceration, we need to look at the Connecticut Judicial Branch. We need to look at, I mean, the Department of Corrections isn't engaging in a recruitment initiative. People are being 
arrested, prosecuted, and referred for sentencing. And we need to look at these cases. Um, I think the uh, uh, attorney, uh, uh, attorney DeLay talked about the Clemency Act on the federal side. We need to look at something similar on the state side. We have people, when I first started my career in law, law enforcement 25 years ago, the average drug sentence we saw was 15 years, eight years, nine years. Some of these people are still sitting in jail for cases where people are not even being arrested. So we need to correct these things. We need to look at those people who got those excessive sentences and, and make the kinds of accommodations that they're doing on the federal side with that clemency. We also um, need to talk about the school to prison pipeline. I know that we have discussed and we've discussed and we've had forums, but you know there is still school systems that are using the police to enforce discipline. What we need to do, one of the things that the NAACP strongly encourages is the um, juvenile review boards. That's a very important component. But we also need police and community civilian review boards because the police and the community have to come together if we're ever going to bridge the gap and start working on really uh, a, 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 an effective and a, a, a positive relationship between the police and the communities. Um, when I, again, I go back to judicial reform, one of the things that I would strongly encourage, there is results-based accountability in most that state government does. And I think we need to add that to the judges. We need a report card. The NAACP has a, 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 an initiative on the national level where when it's a political year, we have report cards for our politicians. Judges need a report card as well. We need to look at how they're sentencing people, if they're sentencing people to these excessive sentences, and it needs to be evaluated. And um, again, that's an important part of the criminal justice reform that we all see. Um, the other interesting thing that we have discussed with Post is decertification. You may from time to time pick up a newspaper where you see that a police officer has engaged in this egregious act. So what we're asking Post to do is enforce their decertification policy. If someone has breached the public trust, we need to pull their training certification so that they can't go before some arbitration board a year down the road or a couple of months down the road and come back to the same employment. So we need to make sure that our bad actors that are giving our law enforcement agencies a bad name are weeded out and they're not able to return back to law enforcement positions. Uh, you know, again, everybody has stole my thunder with the opiate addiction, but you know, again, it goes without saying Time and time again, when you talk to young people, non-minorities, they are using drugs without reproach, without fear of police intervention, or without fear of an arrest, but on the other end of the spectrum, when we're looking at poor and minority communities, what we see is an aggressive police initiative. So we need to talk about that and what that looks like. The loss of life is happening here. That's where the aggressive policing strategies should be employed that's not happening. And um, one thing that I've been very vocal with the U.S. Attorney's Office and also with the FBI, I asked them for transparency. The NAACP has brought a number of complaints, but the policy of the federal government is we can't talk about our investigations. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what they're doing. And I think maybe Grady's position is a result of some of those discussions because I would say to them, we need to be more visible so that the public knows you're doing something because the perception is because you do not discuss it, we don't see it getting done, we conclude that it doesn't happen. So, you know, these are great discussions to have. We need to have more of them. And, uh, you know, I'm concerned when Cheryl tells me that there's a discussion to cut their funding because we are sending them so many cases. What's going to happen with those cases? We need more funding as opposed to less funding. We have cases where we're doing uh, uh, commission-initiated investigations in state agencies. We have issues in private industry. We have issues in education. We get complaints from school systems. We get complaints from families of students in the school systems. And we're just busy, um, and particularly in the school. And I think this is, again, a byproduct of what we see in the media and what we see nationally. But the kids are watching this. They see it on social media. 
they're internalizing it, and now they're trying to act it out in their school systems, and many schools aren't equipped to deal with these issues. We've had an incident where there was a mock lynching in southeastern Connecticut, and they thought that that was fun and a cool thing to do. We recently had a school system in southeastern Connecticut come to us because there is this clash between the students who want to wear the Black Lives Matter t-shirt versus the students who want to wear the White Lives Matter t-shirt. And the school does, it seems to be at a, at a loss on how to deal with that. Um, so it's great that they reached out to the NAACP. I'm also encouraging those school systems to work with the Department of Justice and CHRO. And I also have to stress that it's not a punitive thing to go to the DOJ or CHRO and say, can you do training on this? It's helpful. They're reluctant, but I still have to strongly encourage it. And my last thing before I close is the assimilation training is great. Great idea, but it should be done with a disclaimer. Because when you take a layperson and you put them into a situation where law enforcement officers have had extensive training and expect them to act the same way, that's a little misleading. So thank you again. That's right.